Today I have joining me the lovely Babette Ben Susan. Isn't that a cool name? Now I first met Babette in a lovely Sydney barmy backyard uh, oh. when I was fundraising, yeah, at a barbecue for The Hunger Project. And it was quite funny that our paths had crossed in the background. I didn't know you were secretly a judge of an award I'd entered some time before. <laughs> you never told me if you voted for me or not, so. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> Water under the bridge. Yes. And, yeah, it was a, it was a lovely I suppose, weekend, and we've stayed in touch ever since. So I've used your coaching services a little bit and, yeah, we've stayed friends ever since then. Yeah. Can you please tell me a little bit about what you do, Babette? Well, these days I predominantly coach um, professionals around life, any life situation, leadership issues or business issues. So I, I generally coach people around transitioning when they transition from either they were a manager, they're now a leader, or they had this kind of life, they now want to create something different, or they were on, they're running a company, now they want to go on boards, or they're looking at growing their business. So, right, and you used the Myers Myers Briggs, I and did. you're one of the very few people who does energy leadership. That's What's that about? Right. It's what I love this tool because. The Energy Leadership Index does three key things. Number one, it looks at your leadership ability, how good you are, not only at motivating others, but at motivating yourself to move forward and take action. The second thing is how conscious you are of, of all the things, how aware you are of life and all the things around you. And the third thing is how engaged are you with what you're doing and with life in general. So it's a great tool to understand where people are because you can only read and interpret the questions with your current level of consciousness and engagement with life. So um, mm. I get clients to do it at the beginning and then they do one at the end and they can see the impact in their thinking wow. on uh, as a result of the coaching. So it's a great tool from that perspective. Yeah, fabulous. I did it the once. I haven't done it since. So I'll have to come back for round Ooh, two. Yes. <laughs> yes, we should. And you've also yeah. had... A big transition since we spoke as well. I think when we first met, you were living in Sydney and working oh, down there, and you've now joined me in my home state of Queensland. Yes. So what happened is uh, three years ago, um, my husband retired, and I knew that if we kept living in St Leonard's, which we were living in, or living in Sydney, that our lives would not change. They'd get taken up by the routine of things and we wanted to travel we wanted to do things so we decided to, to move well I decided to move. <laughs> <laughs> says the woman full of the energy leadership here <laughs> <laughs> and we went um it was a choice between the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast and I just I fell in love with the Sunshine Coast and also I have to admit my best friend lives here and I had a couple of other friends that lived here so it was just evident. I know you lived on the Gold Coast and my brother lived on the Gold Coast but look we're only three hours away by car not even. Well two and a half now and half having said know. that the Sunshine Coast is probably the Gold Coast 20 years ago before it, we got stupid busy down here so it's yeah. probably a little more relaxed up there. As a Gold Coast girl, I'm, I'm allowed to say that. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think it's a lot more relaxed than the lifestyle down here now. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 live, I love it up here. And there's still a lot of greenery and there's still a lot of, you know, the beaches and everything. It's just wonderful. Yeah, it is gorgeous. Absolutely. It is. Now, when you contributed to my book, you know, one of the favourite questions I had asking everyone was about their life growing up and the impact their parents had on their finances. And can you please share a little bit with me about growing up as the daughter of immigrants in Australia, which is, look, I suppose most people here, if you're not Indigenous, you're a boat person somehow. So how did you end up here as a boat person, Babette? Well, um, I, you know, and I really think that's a very insightful question to understand the impact that family role modelling has on financials. And I think you're dead right. So my parents came out to Australia. We came out to Australia in, um, gosh, late 1950s, 
early 1960. And we came from Morocco uh, to Australia. We came out to look-see, but my father liked it so much, we decided to stay. So it, it was interesting. As migrants, they were risk-averse, highly risk-averse. Um, because they didn't know the language, they didn't know that the, the language we grew up with was French. Um, so they, you know, they didn't know the English language, the English lifestyle. And, and you know, in the 1960s, Australia was not very international to the way it is nowadays. So it was very... And it's so funny you say they're risk averse when they're making one of the biggest, riskiest, boldest decisions of their lives to go to a country and a culture but that is so foreign. You raise to a what... very good point, Amanda. They were financially risk averse. Yes. So yes. my parents really, we didn't come out as migrants. We came out to look and then we stayed and became Australian citizens after that. But you're right. It is a huge risk they were taking, leaving family, friends, the culture, everything that they'd known. But financially, they were, my father was very risk averse. Now, your father was a professor? Yes, he was a lecturer and professor at Macquarie University teaching French literature. So he wanted to make oh, wow. sure we were <laughs> uh, academically strong as children. But, you know, um, my father hated debt. I remember clearly if he owed anyone money, he couldn't sleep. Wow. Okay. So, so it wasn't a tool for him. So it was a noose around his neck. Yeah. So he, he was saving. So we never had a mortgage on the house or if we did, it was a tiny, tiny mortgage. We never borrowed for money on cards. Dad was willing to lend us money as child, as his children, but, highly, highly reluctant to borrow it from anywhere. So he, we came from a very saving conscious family. Um, and, and because of that, it made me aware that having everything in one asset was not a smart move. So it was all in the family property? That was yes. how he chose to invest? in the family invest? home or in super... Uh, you know, and saving so we could go overseas and travel. Um, so, but I learned from a very young age, you know, we had to do our pocket money, you know, chores to get pocket money to save. I mean, when I got my first car, I paid for it out of my own savings. I worked, the moment I was 15 and nine months, I worked on Saturdays, you know, and I worked yep. as an usherette in the cinema that's why I got to see Butch Cassidy and the Sundance in 29 <laughs> times. <laughs> you can say that word for word to this day, I'm sure. I know the errors. I know all the errors in that movie. <laughs> and um, I worked in a, in a pharmacy. Um, God, yeah. So <laughs> I learned Don't to... Don't your memory name. <laughs> I learned to save. So, yeah, um, that's the... It was the key thing of seeing him only... With that focus no no debt he did try to dabble in the stock exchange or in the stock market and he didn't do well um, i think they lost their money so they were very risk averse to all this kind of stuff because i think they they listened to people's advice rather than do some of the work themselves so when you say they listen to people's advice, what sort of people are we talking about here? Are we talking the taxi driver, the neighbour, no, or a financial a professional? Broker. Yeah. A uh, stockbroker? Stock okay. So a, a stockbroker. Okay. So someone who just takes orders rather than gives financial advice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't right. think they ever, apart from an accountant, tax advisor or an accountant, yep. they never listen to never had financial advice professional advice yeah so you have had this very traditional upbringing how old were you when the family moved out who when i moved you. out yes uh, i think i was in my 20s <laughs> oh okay so you for you it was a big change as well then you'd completed your schooling yes in morocco and then i oh no i completed my schooling here in australia 
Okay. And then um, went and became a secretary, started working as soon as possible. Then I went to live in the States and worked in the States for a couple of years. Um, so you sound a bit more of a risk taker than mum and dad. Interestingly enough, I'm more, and that's an interesting question, Amanda. I'm a risk taker with my life, not necessarily with my money. So you still have that very traditional view around money, perhaps more risk averse, but you love to take, a, a, I suppose, a hold of opportunities yes. in your life to yes. grasp those experiences yes. rather than financial. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. And I think I think you nailed it. That, that, that is spot on, spot on. So, so when you come from this, you know, I suppose financially risk-averse background, apart from mum and dad teaching you about savings and being very careful, you know, mum was the stay-at-home, dad was the breadwinner, you yes. know, very traditional style family, what was the best financial advice you ever, ever received as, apart from mum and dad and where did you come across that advice? The best advice was uh, a little book called The Richest Man in Babylon by George uh, Klassen, I think, yes. Yes, yes, that's right. That, where you set aside some of your money. So he, in essence, you set, uh, you live on some money, but you set aside uh, money to donate, to, to give to charity. And I think that's a wonderful thing to do. And then you also set, uh, put money aside for savings. So you split whatever, let's say you earn a hundred dollars a week or a day. So what you do is, you put 10% uh, aside you might give, 10% or 20, 25% you might save, and the rest you live on. Um, you don't have to worry about save if you can afford it. The sad thing is that nowadays a lot of people can't even afford to, to live on what they earn. But yes. I think, and maybe I'm being too harsh, Amanda, you're more likely to advise, but I think it's because they keep wanting things that they really don't need. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Just stuff. Yeah. So well, I, I suppose think we also live in a very... Stuff yeah. ...that they've spent money on when they could have kept, you know, when they could live on 70%. Yeah, we didn't need that, you know, the Sheridan towel set or the sheet set or the extra boat or the bigger boat or whatever I it agree. was. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree, you know, and, and uh, you know, so, yeah, I... I so that is um, yeah. the best advice. And, look, it is a classic book, um, The Richest Man in Babylon. So if you haven't heard of that one, do go download or um, oh, buy it. it. I'm sure every second-hand bookstore's got a copy of that one. Yeah. Have you personally ever had any financial setbacks, Babette, and how did you overcome those? To be honest, I've never had any financial setbacks. Compared to a lot of other you people, you think that is because, because I, I of save. Your, you? You're a saver. Yep, yeah, I've always saved. That's what I got. The role modelling I got from my father. Um, the richest man in Babylon was the biggest one. So, if you look at the role modelling I got from my father, the books I read, and also um, I had some finance. Of dear, my best friend was a financial advisor. And so I you just surrounded yourself with it all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I learned from her the importance of setting aside a net, nest egg. I've always, because that's how I bought my car, that's how I got my the things I wanted, travel, you know. You but you've never gone in over your head, obviously, to have those reverses. No, I never. You know, the only thing is that the one thing that was interesting is that I recall my mother used to say I spent too much, that I wasn't saving enough as a deposit for a unit because every time I'd saved enough money that I felt I'd have some emergency money set aside. But then I'd, I'd travel somewhere. I'd go overseas or, you know, 
And my mother, oh, you're wasting the money. You should be buying a unit. <laughs> Enjoying all those experiences we were talking about, yeah. building up all those, yeah. And, and I have to say, I, I'm really glad I enjoyed those experiences. But I'm also well, glad I saved. Yeah, I suppose if you look at things now, in the last three years, you know, hubby's retired, you've moved to the Sunshine Coast. Yep. And now the world's shut down with a pandemic. And if you'd saved all your life to travel now and couldn't do it, and I'm sure you're not the only person in this situation where you go, look, we'll put it off, we'll we'll work hard, we'll have the kids, we'll pay off the mortgage, we'll put it aside, and now all of a sudden we can't leave sometimes the state that we live in, it must be very, very difficult for those people to reconcile that they've made all these sacrifices and this has been taken away from them, I this agree. life experience. Yeah, I So very and, difficult. And you, one of the reasons we also came up here was that, uh, and to live in a unit, is that we could lock the door and go overseas. So we were meant, our, our goal was to travel once or twice a year overseas, you know, for and I remember weeks, saying, two to three week blocks twice, you know. Yep, you saved all these frequent flyer points to do that too. So I remember Boy, you saying have that. Boy, we ever. In the bank. <laughs> more in the bank, more in the They're bank. They're in the bank. They're in the bank waiting to be used if they don't expire. Excellent. Yeah, well, hopefully not. Hopefully yeah. not. Now, you mentioned your girlfriend was a financial right. advisor. Did you ever use the services of financial professionals yourself? You said your father didn't. So have you ever used a financial advisor and how did that go? Okay. So we, when I used my friend, I was very happy with what she did because looking at annuities, at super funds, um, different kinds of investments and all of this term deposits the, the whole the spreading things around diversification yeah fabulous fabulous but then we went with some when she retired out of the business the rotten sod um <laughs> How dare she <laughs> but she made so much money she retired early <laughs> good on her i know so when we went to others the advice, and maybe by that stage too, I was better educated in what to look for. Uh, so I don't think their advice was that good. And I'll say one thing, because it was tied into a particular company. Right. And now I think that's the worst thing that you can have, whether you're tied into AMP, MLC, any of those things. The big guys, yep. Yeah. Didn't work for you. It's really interesting, actually. So what I'm hearing is that your friend listened to you. She knew you, obviously, being a little more risk-averse, spread the risk for you with diversification. You don't feel the others listened and did that for you? As they advisors, were... it was more about the product than the strategy? Big guy. Right. Yeah, I think it was more about the products and the strategy, and um, yeah. I also think that sometimes there are financial planners who a don't really listen, or have been hyped to believe in their abilities more than they have in their capability to deliver. Right. Yes. So, um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, uh, I think there are, a, um, yeah. So we, uh, we both, my husband and I both pulled out of it all and I've been managing my own financial portfolio ever since. So, so how did you end up coming to the decision where you'd been advised, then didn't like the advice and you said you started to look at things yourself you've obviously moved into a self-managed space how did you make that leap from being an advised person to going this isn't for me anymore i'm going to do it myself the how did that happen the losses losses yeah. okay just and what did you do to become qualified enough in your own eyes to be able to manage it or confident enough maybe i thought if these are the losses i have to live with i'd rather try and do it my way so I, I remember you telling me you started doing, was it courses to learn more? 
I did do some. Yes, I did. I did do some things to become better informed. I, I think the other thing is um, when I did my MBA, doing corporate finance, um, understanding econ economics. I think that really helped me understand the market and how it operates a little better, and that made a big. A big so there's a big picture in education yeah. and understanding. And, so, yeah. um, and then because of that, I've, I've kept up to date and reading. And running my own business, you're aware of taxation implications, tax issues. So now you start building both the learnings that you have from economics and the um, reading that you do and tax implications. You put the two. It suddenly starts. Look, Amanda, to be honest, to find a good financial planner, someone that helps you and understands you, I think is the most critical thing anybody can do until they start to getting more and more educated and are willing to do it themselves. But I think financial so, planners are vital to a lot of people. So looking back... Or for someone who's about to maybe meet or thinking about meeting with an advisor for the first time, what questions or would you get them to ask or advice would you give them for how do you pick a financial planner that will suit you? The number one thing is what is it? So for me, I would be clear what I wanted to achieve. What so be I clear on your goals? Sorry? So tell the planner you're very clear oh, on your goals? Very clear on your goals. Be very clear because a financial planner can't read your friggin' mind. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be an amazing amount of people we have to tease the goals out of. <laughs> so my first thing is be very clear on the goals you want and by when. Okay? Give it a deadline. Deadline. The second thing is the second thing is be very clear of the milestones that you work out with your financial planner to get to that goal. So let's say um, you've got a goal that you want to turn your, let's say your $50,000 into $150,000 in five years. So maybe they'll say, okay, put 20% in, in a term deposit, and let's put 30% or 30,000 in, in uh, stocks. Or, or I mean, I, you know what I'm saying. So yeah. if you're not beginning to move down that path in a positive way, something's wrong. Alarms bells should be going off between you and your financial planner. So, and, and maybe you need to put some in a self-managed super fund. I don't know. You know, yeah. what, what I'm saying is be very clear in your goals and have clear milestones and then make sure that your financial advisor has heard you. If they say, I hear what you say, however, I would suggest this, your financial planner hasn't heard you. Right. Because there are other ways. What is stopping you from going down this path is what I would expect the financial planner to ask. So be educating you as well as listening to you. Yes. <laughs> well Got said. It. As usual, Amanda, <laughs> very well <laughs> <laughs> now, for people whose eyes glaze over when they hear the word budget, do you run one and stick to one and why? Absolutely. Uh, to, let, let's put it this way. If you want to drown in debt, forget a budget. But if you don't want debt, if you want to be able to give yourself things you want in your life you've got to have a budget because you need to plan for it unless of course you're planning on winning the lottery <laughs> there's always a chance <laughs> you've got a bigger chance of being run over than you do <laughs> or catching COVID at the moment That's possibly <laughs> of winning the lottery. but no Amanda <laughs> honestly I think for people who want to have a uh, have things in their life if it's a goal to travel or start up your own business or um, take care of your parents or buy another property these are all budgetary goals 
if you don't budget, then how do you create it? You create your reality. No one else does. So if you don't budget for it, then how do you create your, the reality you'd like? True. Now, you've mentioned there about having the business. You've obviously run a budget personally. Do you also run cash flow projections and a budget for your business as well as running one in your personal life? Um, I'm very naughty. <laughs> I have a budget for my business. Right. But I don't do the cash flow. Right. Okay. So um, I think it's because I'm, I'm now a small business. So I know, I always knew the bills when they were coming up and what cash I needed. But I always made sure that I had reserves. And that was my cash flow was the reserve in the business. Um, but a budget, absolutely. I know exactly how much I have to bring in every year. I know exactly how much my expenses are every year. Um, I know how I'm going. I do an, on my accounts. I have an NYOB. I, every month, every week, <laughs> I have how am I you progressing. recommend having um, so many months' worth of expenses in cash in the business to cover the unexpected in case things muck up or yeah we have a pandemic or yeah i i would i would i'd always recommend having some money for me i always made sure i had about ten thousand dollars yep not a lot and i hear other people say you know three months or six months worth of expenses so it depends whatever I you agree. choose to, i agree yep. and and for me it was i was looking between 10 to fifteen thousand was always in the bank as emergency funding now, for someone who's had very rich life experiences and has coached some amazing people into some new places, comes from this very conservative background, what would be your favourite form of investment? Well, I get a lot of fun in investing in stocks, stock prices. So I have investments in... So it's understanding companies that are doing extraordinary things. Like uh, we invested, I invested a long time ago in ResMed, CSL. That must have done quite well lately. Yeah, <laughs> I have. So let me say this. One of my, I need to point, and it's not fair but because of my background, but I ran my consulting practice before I got into coaching. I ran a consulting practice in strategy and competition. And one of the issues around strategy is understanding where the future lies, what's happened. Now, I happen, all of us know, that the big growth industries over the next 10, 15, 20 years are going to be health, uh, IT, technology. Um, so why would you not invest in those companies? <laughs> I think the futurists are all over that too, pointing out, you know, which which way, what are the global mega trends? I believe they're Correct. called. And so, then, yeah. So what I did is 10, 15 years ago, I looked at the mega trends and that's when I bought stocks. Uh, so you're not only saying keep an eye on what's happening but understand where you're putting the money and where things are going yeah. to Absolutely. You know, just jump onto crypto because Cabby said it was a great I idea. Touch, yes, I wouldn't touch crypto. <laughs> I wouldn't touch it. I think. And uh, is that more because of not understanding or because it's something you don't see as having a picture in the future as far as megatrends go? Um, my cons okay. Uh, I don't understand it that, that well as some people do. But when few people hold most of it, and can change its value, whether they sell or buy, like Elon Musk. I won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. It's too dangerous, too volatile to somebody's whim. And it's Understood. interesting because I learned this in a, in a job I had. I was working for a very, very wealthy man, and he retired to Monaco, as one does when you have... Poor thing. <laughs> you have Do you know how much the gelato is in Monaco? <laughs> and, but the, he told me a story one day. Um, he was in Monaco and I, I was passing through many moons ago 
and he was laughing and I said, what was wrong? And he says, oh, he just, because he just had a call and he says, a stockbroker called him to ask him what he knew because there were movements, sudden movements in the Australian dollar and he had so much wealth they had assumed he was making, he was selling short the dollars. So, you know, for one man to have that impact, that someone calls up to say, what do you know? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing and what do you know? And it, it just was an eye-opener. And Bitcoin's the same. Elon Musk sells and the thing drops 25%. Too dangerous. I wouldn't touch it. Interesting that. take. So... If you had one financial tip to leave our listeners today with all your wonderful experience, <laughs> what would your top financial tip be, Babette? Well, I, I, there'd be two, if I may. Okay. Yes, please. The first one is definitely, definitely, I would speak to a financial advisor if you're starting out or if you don't understand how to control your money. I really, And instead of speaking what I call... I think financial advisors, good ones, I would now call them financial coaches. Yes. Okay. And there are many who've left the, I suppose, the product space and moved into the money coaching I space agree. for that reason. I yeah. agree. You know, what's stopping you from growing your money? So I, I would say, and I think you, you're a financial coach in my book because I, I've spoken to you many times about things and I've seen what you, you do. You listen to people and so therefore I'd say the first piece of advice is get a financial coach someone who was a financial advisor or is a financial advisor the second thing is diversify don't put your eggs in one basket and maybe the third thing is listen to the richest man in Babylon <laughs> one one thing I remember you sharing with me was that you also invested in quality and you told the story of how you bought this beautiful suit that cost an absolute fortune in Italy. In Florence. <laughs> but, right. In Florence, yes, but it lasted you for, for many, many years, whereas some other cheap suits, for want of a better word, had, had worn out and weren't worth it. So I, I always remember that story. You're amazing. Can you share a little bit more about you. that? <laughs> but it, it is a thing about quality versus over quantity, you know. Um, and you'll often find uh, cultures uh, will focus a lot. There are many European cultures that will focus on quality rather than the quantity. And I think this is what's important about having a quality financial coach rather than, uh, you know, a cheaper coach, you know, was it the toe peanut? Now I need to know: Do you still have that suit? No. <laughs> <laughs> I put on weight. <laughs> Who'd be a woman? No. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Sorry, darling. I wish I. Did. But I've got to tell you, I only got rid of it three years ago. So I had it. So how long had you had it? Like twenty years. Up. Wow, that is definitely years. a quality item, isn't it? Yeah, twenty years. Well, that just years. tells me I just need to go to Milan to do my wardrobe. Well, shopping. it just tells me I've got more <laughs> <all this> weight. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Thank you. If I had put on the <laughs> weight. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, Babette. I've loved catching up and chatting with you again. I will put um, the link to The Richest Man in Babylon in the show notes so that people who don't remember that can go and find it. But thank you so much again for joining me. Oh, Amanda, it's been a pleasure. It always is lots of fun catching <laughs> up with you. I really enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.